So I'll start with uh, my short presentation from the axis, and then we'll go on uh, according to the uh, plan. So as suggested uh, by the title of my lecture, uh, my objective in the next coming 20 minutes or so is to try and clarify two issues, or maybe to answer two different questions. The first is to describe the contemporary anti-traumatic therapy in patients with ACS in Israel. And the second one is to examine whether there is a significant intercenter variability in anti-traumatic therapy. To do so, we analyze the AXIS 2010 data. As you all probably know, the AXIS is a two-month biannual nationwide ACS survey which, docu which documents all ACS patients who are admitted to each of the 26 cardiac departments in Israel. AXIS 2010 included 1,781 patients. About one third of the patients presented with ST elevation MI and underwent primary PCI. Another 15% of the patient presented with ST elevation MI as well, but did not undergo primary PCI. The major two reasons for not undergoing primary PCI was of course late arriving and uh, spontaneous reperfusion. To note that 17, one seven patients out of this group were treated with thrombolysis and those patients was, were 2% of the entire uh, STEMI population and 3% of the patient with STEMI undergoing a primary perfusion. So very few patients in, in Israel in 2010, I believe in less so in 2011, are being treated with thrombolysis. 1,005 patients presented with non-ST elevation AMI and of whom 61% underwent PCI during index hospitalization. So to the major issue in this uh, talk, how did we treat our patient? This slide describes the use of glycoprotein 2 b 3 a antagonists in patient among patients undergoing PCI during PCI. As you can see on the left side, more than 57% of patients presenting with ST elevation MI and underwent primary PCI were treated with uh, 2B3A antagonist. Only 37% of those who underwent PCI later in the course of ST elevation MI were treated with the 2B3A antagonist, and less than 20% of the patient who underwent PCI in the course of non-ST elevation MI were treated with 2B3A antagonist. Those are the numbers regarding angiomas. Pay attention, the scale is uh, quite different. And 10% of the patient, of the prime PCI patient, were treated with angiomax as compared to 5% in other ACS patients undergoing PCI, but not in the setting of primary PCI. What about thianopyridines in 2010 in Israel? This slide describes the dramatic increase in the use of thianopyridines, or maybe I should say in clopidogrel, from AXIS 2000 to AXIS 2010 in ACS patients both with those presented with ST elevation in green and those without ST elevation. Why? Anyway, it was tremendous increase in the use of, of clopidogrel. Not surprisingly, in AXIS 2010, Virtually all patients who underwent PCI were treated with clopidogrel. This is not interesting. However, while vast majority of patients who underwent PCI not in the setting of primary PCI because of ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI were treated with clopidogrel, was, were loaded with clopidogrel before the PCI. But only 84% of those who underwent primary PCI for ST elevation MI were loaded before the primary PCI. Is it important? Yes, probably it is. This slide describes the result of a retrospective study from our group, Paul Pfeffer sitting with us here. He was the first writer on this paper. The paper was based on the result of AXIS 2008, and we were able to show that uh, pretreatment with clopidogrel before primary PCI is or was 
independent predictor, negative predictor value of, uh, of MACE, of major adverse cardiac event. So it is important to treat patients, uh, to reload them or to load them before primary PCI. This slide describes or summarizes the number of patients treated with high dose or loaded with high dose clopidogrel. Here we can see a mirror image of the prior slide. While 92% of patients undergoing primary PCI were loaded when they were loaded with high dose 600 milligrams of clopidogrel, only less than 40% of the patients who underwent PCI in the course of non-ST elevation MI were loaded. All of them were loaded, but only less than 40% were loaded with 600 milligrams or more. To me, this is very surprising. I was surprised by, when I prepared, get myself prepared to this lecture, I was su surprised by this finding. And I was surprised because already in 2005, the Amida 2 studies showed in similar patients that loading patients with 600 milligrams, it was a prospective, well-designed study that loading patients with 600 milligrams of clopidogrel as compared to three milligrams of clopidogrel was associated, or maybe I should say resulted in much significantly better clinical outcome. Number of points regarding primary PCI. This slide show you actually the pre-hospital treatment in our hand of patient with primary, P with ST elevation MI undergoing primary PCI, or more precisely, it's not exactly pre-hospital because this slide summarizes the treatment given by both the EMS and or the ER teams. Actually, all 70% of the patients were loaded or reloaded with aspirin, and that's good. But only 50% of the patients were given IV heparin or low molecular weight heparin, very few. And less than one third of the patients were loaded with clopidogrel at this setting of kind of pre-hospital, maybe pre-cardiology pre setting. Is this important? Is this good enough? Again, I'm not sure. In a retrospective study, which, which was published just a couple of months ago in circulation, in a retrospective analysis of the Horizon study, it was shown that both early in this, in, in their case, it was pre-randomization, but I will take it a little bit farther on. I will say that early loading with 600 milligrams of clopidogrel here, as well as administration of IV heparin, early IV heparin, were both associated, were both independent predictor value of stent thrombosis, and actually negative, of course, negative uh, independent predictors, and the administration of IV heparin early, prior to randomization to the Horizon study, was actually independent predictor value of the cumulative two years uh, stent thrombosis really important. Few issues regarding specific, more specific to non-ST elevation MI. Where do we stand, where do, do we stand with non-ST elevation unstable angina patients? So in this slide you can see that in our hand, about in the red, in the red uh, 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 histogram, about one third of the patients are being treated with unfortunate heparin. More than 50% with low molecular heparin and very few with Fonda or Angiomax. It's, very, it's not very, this slide is not uh, very scientific, I would say, and of course is hardly hampered by uh, many confounders, but I could not restrain myself presenting this slide after seeing the result, which followed very nicely, we are speaking about registry, followed very nicely what we know from the literature. Among the low molecular weight treated non-ST elevation MI patient, the rate of major bleeding was 2.6, 2.1 in alpha action heparin, a little bit lower, as we know uh, uh, from the literature, and actually none of the patients with an or who were treated with angiomax or fondopalminol had major bleeding. Of course, it's thousands of confounders, but it's still interesting that in registry, we see the same signal that we uh, uh, can see in the literature. What about treatment of patients with non-ST elevation MI upon discharge? Many of them, if not all of them were treated with aspirin, it's not surprising. A little bit more than 80% were discharged with recommendation to take clopidogrel. 
and very few patients were, were, for various reasons, were discharged with love on warfarin or low molecular weight heparin. Now I'm getting to the second question uh, uh, that, I, that I raised in the beginning of my, my, my talk, which is, are we all the same, at least with respect to treatment with anti-thrombotic uh, uh, therapy in patients with ACAC? The answer is definitely no, and I will show you. This slide summarizes or describes the number of patients treated with lycoprotein 2B3A like during primary PCI as for each of the 23 centers which perform primary PCI in Israel. As you can see, number, small number, but number, sizable number of, of centers still hold 2B3A as a routine therapy in primary PCI. But on the other hand, about one third of the centers in Israel, less than 50 or 50 or less of the percent of the patients undergoing primary PCI are not being treated with 2B3A anymore. What about loading with clopidogrel? I raised this issue and shed some light on, on this issue. To me, it's a very important one. Once again, significant variability in the amount the number of patients who are being loaded before primary PCI. About one third of the uh, of the centers in about one third of the patients, not all not all patients, and in some of them even not most of the patients are being loaded with clopidogrel prior to primary PCI. This slide show the the, the situation in the ER because beside I see Aya here beside Shachal, and there were very few patients who were loaded with clopidogrel because they brought in by by Shachal, but basically in Israel we don't have the clopidogrel or other tyanoperidine uh, on the uh, 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 on the mobile intensive care. So, so when I'm speaking about when I'm speaking about giving a, a clopidogrel to a patient prior to primary PCI in the pre-hospital or pre-cardiology setting, we are speaking about the ER. Here you can see the huge diversity in the number of patients who were treated who were loaded with clopidogrel while in the ER on their way to primary PCI. The viability in treating patients was even bit bigger when we uh, speak about the patient with non-ST elevation MI. And in this slide, you can see the diversity in the number of patients in different centers being treated with 2B3A antagonist while undergoing PCI in the course of non-ST elevation MI. In treating patients with high dose clopidogrel, in treating patients with heparin and low molecular weight heparin. In summary, I can see I can say that overall there is high adherence to current guidelines, and that's of course explained the good outcome of ACS in Israel, which we show in other settings. Yet, despite we are dealing with a country of what a little bit more than seven million people, one public system, relatively homogeneous population, there is great variability between center as regard anti-thrombotic management. Thank you very much.